Hi, everyone. I think we can get started now. My name is Charles Ovink. I'm a political affairs officer with the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs. And I want to just kick us off by welcoming you and thanking you for spending the time with us on behalf of myself and our office and our partners at CIPRI, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, and on behalf of our joint project, which is generously funded by the European Union, which is the Promoting Responsible Innovation in AI for Peace and Security uh, program. As part of this, we're doing outreach and work with a very wide set of multi-stakeholder actors that are engaged with AI and responsible AI programs, as well as issues around peace and security in AI as it relates to the wider community, but also as we engage with civil society, academia, industry, everyone who might be engaged. So I wanna start by just saying a few words of what our aim is today, and then I'll introduce the three panelists that we're very lucky to have with us and give a quick uh, rules of the game for today. So I'm gonna start by emphasizing that the dual use risk associated with the development of AI has been a key element of recent major policy developments. So we're talking about things like discussions at the UN Security Council, last year's AI Safety Summit, the EU AI Act, the G7 Code of Conduct, and things like that. And this dual use risk is associated also with the convergence of AI and the bio sector. And that's one area of particular concern for those discussions. There's significant fear that recent advances of AI could exacerbate biosecurity risks and could facilitate the wider enabling of an environment of biological weapon development and tentatively or potentially enable development of new or more harmful biological weapons or lower the technical threshold for those activities. The dual use risk is obviously not a new issue and especially for the bio community, that's something that's been dealt with for some time. And that area already has processes and practices set up to identify, to evaluate, and to address some of those risks. So a key goal of the discussion today is to look at what the AI community more broadly can learn from what the bio community is already doing, especially as we start to think about openness, sensitivity of certain models and certain uh, research, and that kind of thing. So the conversation with our three speakers will revolve around three topics. First, we will discuss what the AI and the bio sector have in common, especially when it comes to dual use risks. Second, we'll discuss what bio risk governance looks like and delve into what the current instruments are to mitigate the risks of misuse in the biological domain and maybe some of the lessons that could be taken from that. And third, we'll try and identify the concrete lessons for the AI community of all of this. So this will take the form of a uh, panelist conversation. We're going to try and be as conversational as we can over the course of today. There will also be options for questions from the audience you can uh, type those in or submit them to our uh, moderators, and we'll be at the end of the discussion, opening some of those up to the panelists for review. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce our three panelists, and then we'll get straight into the discussion. So first we have uh, Eleanor Powles, who is unfortunately suffering from some uh, technical difficulties at the moment, so I think can't be on camera, but is obviously listening and will engage fully. Eleanor is a senior fellow with the Global Center on Cooperative Security in New York and conducts in-depth research on the security and governance implications generated by the convergence of AI with other dual-use technologies. She regularly provides expertise to the World Bank and the UN, as well as US and European authorities, and is part of the scientific committee of the International Association for Responsible Research and Innovation in Genome Editing. We're also joined by Clarissa Rios Rojas, who is a political affairs officer for UNODA working with the Biological Weapons Convention, she has a PhD in molecular biology and a master's degree in biomedicine and neuroscience. And prior to joining us at ODA, she was a research associate with the Center for Existential Risk at the University of Cambridge. And we also have uh, Rick Blyth. Rick is the head of the Netherlands Biosecurity Office at the National Institute of Public Health and the Environment, RIBM. And he holds a PhD in the fields of molecular biology and tumor immunology. And he previously worked as a scientific coordinator of the Netherlands Advisory Commission on Genetic Modification. So with that, I'm going to pass to my colleague, Vincent, to get us started with the first of these discussion areas. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Vincent Boulanin. I'm a, a program director at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, and I, I lead the work that we do on, on the governance of AI. So I would like to kind of like start by setting the stage um, and talk a bit about what the AI and bio sector have in common. Um, so I'd like to first, first to kind of turn to to our colleague uh, panelist Eleonore, uh, since I know that you have been uh, working on the opportunities and challenges at the intersection between AI and biology for, for quite a long time. 
Um, so in, in the expert conversation, we, we often, you know, AI is often compared to, uh, to the field of biology, especially when it comes to kind of so-called dual use risk. Uh, and here, the underlying idea is that both, you know, advances in AI and, and biology can be, you know, immensely beneficial, uh, but it can also be misused for, for very harmful uh, purposes. Uh, we all know that AI can be misused, for instance, to conduct kind of disinformation uh, campaigns, uh, while the advance in, in biology can be misused to engineer dangerous uh, pathogens and biological weapons. And also, like, both sectors have kind of been experiencing kind of very rapid development over the past years, and, and it's possible that some of these could have very kind of unforeseen negative consequences. So to set the stage, I thought that maybe it could be helpful uh, for, for us to kind of, uh, you know, try to uh, ask you to elaborate a bit on that comparison, uh, Eleonore. So that would be my first question in terms of, in your view, you know, what do the AI and bio uh, sector have in common? And, and also what, you know, what makes these sectors kind of different, especially when it comes to kind of like safety and, and security uh, considerations? Over to you, Eleonore. Well, good afternoon. Thank you so much, Vincent. Thank you, Charlie and Clarissa and Rick uh, for the opportunity to share insights uh, with all of you and then learn from your expertise. And please accept my, my apologies for the technical uh, issue on my end, not being able to use the, the camera option. Uh, so that's it's a question that could take us uh, an hour, right? So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to try to focus on what I think are really uh, strategic commonalities, convergences, for our discussion on responsible innovation, and then I will end uh, with the differences. So first, you mentioned very well the dual use potential. Uh, both AI and biotechnologies are a transformative and critical part of our civilian industries, yet they are inherently dual use technologies. So meaning that their most fundamental core techniques could be weaponized, yet the same techniques are also important for beneficial and pro prophylactic measures. So in the case of biotech, we could even talk of a false dichotomy of dual use, as almost all biotechnology in service of human health can be subverted for misuse by hostile nations and trade actors. Uh, in other words, any nation with a modern pharmaceutical industry has the potential to make bioweapons. And similar conclusions can be drawn when it comes to AI technologies. Very core capabilities of AI systems can be used for positive innovation, for instance, in cyber defense and early warning systems, or could be harnessed for precise surveillance, behavioral manipulation. Uh, you mentioned it, offensive cyber and info ops, and autonomous weapons. So there is an increasing blurred blurred line between what could become civilian or what could be turned into offensive AI and biotechnologies. Then second, I think it's important to highlight that convergence complexifies our notion of dual use potential. So as AI and biotechnologies are rapidly developing in silico, in digital spaces, with uh, digitized architectures, tools, and processes, they're also converging. And therefore, uh, they are merging a host of capabilities that give them more autonomy. So think of cap capabilities such as uh, data fusion, predictive modeling, adaptive learning, and automation. And these trends, both in AI and biotech, do not only accelerate the pace of innovation, uh, but they may also produce complex emerging behaviors and properties whose consequences are difficult to anticipate, mitigate, and control. And in, in AI, we have started seeing examples of these emerging properties or increased forms of autonomy. Uh, for instance, you know, when you see algorithmic malware that can learn to predict, evade, or resist cybersecurity defenses and evolve a different hiding strategy for targeted cyber attacks, similar adaptive learning dynamics exist in uh, AI target uh, tracking and recognition systems. And just as uh, generative AI systems can be manipulated to share controversial or malicious content, we have seen how AI models used to predict bioactivity in drug discovery can also be repurposed uh, to produce toxic molecules. So similar forms of repurposing or manipulation could target an array of AI systems within modern biotech labs. And importantly, both AI and biotech are vulnerable to adversarial attacks. So attacks on their operating systems and on the integrity of their data sets. So the convergence with AI may play a significant role, positive or adversarial, in how we manage emerging uh, biological properties and genomics complexity. 
And I think this is actually a very important point for our discussion on dual use and responsible innovation. Uh, the convergence of AI and biotech, which means you know, more powerful ways to understand, but also weaponize uh, genomics functions, really shows us that future risks are about dual use knowledge, about intentionality in AI and biodesign, more than about physical equipment. And it forces all of us to take the problem under the angle, uh, what should practitioners try to anticipate, prevent, and control, and how to anticipate and continuously redefine dual use, uh, which is a, a good segue to what could be a third point, uh, democratization amplifies transfer of dual use expertise and techniques. And both sectors, AI and biotech, are undergoing powerful digital transformation and therefore democratizing access to core techniques, tech, tech equipment and expertise. And in AI, uh, this is happening through open source AI research, mentorship, access to AI tools, data sets and platforms, cloud computing services, but also Web3 increasingly. And recent examples in facial recognition and generative AI have shown the potential for decentralization and a proliferation of uses. Uh, the same way almost every aspect of modern biotech from design, experimentation to production can be outsourced in decentralized supply chains. And most development in genomics are increasingly produced and captured in reverse genetics protocols, in AI mining platforms, AI benchwork, and automated uh, biotech labs. And so this integration of AI and automation may progressively lead to the, the, to the design of you know, novel experiments with less outside guidance, and also to the outsourcing to a broader and more diverse pool of, uh, of users. New form of immersive design and mentorship, I was mentioning Web3, may also accelerate the potential for transfer of dual use knowledge across sectors that are critical uh, to security. And then fourth, uh, and, and probably last commonality uh, that I will have time to highlight here, Balancing innovation and security is the next challenge for AI and bio, both of them. Uh, that question and dilemma irrigate the whole domain of AI and biotech and their convergence. It is a question for bioengineers when they publish virus assembly protocols or work on open vaccine platforms. It is a question for AI engineers when they release the source code of algorithms used in drug discovery or other platforms. And while there is a risk of misuse, at the same time, access and refining the performance of those tools is also strategic for innovation, safety, and security. So in the future, we may need to explore different openness models, uh, different phase gate processes to be sure that sensitive dual use AI and biotechnologies do not spread to organizations that fall outside uh, the scope of due diligence. Now, in terms of differences, I think we can approach it from the angle of the changing risk calculus, civilian harm, and the issue of tech feasibility. Um, biotechnology still presents significant challenges in terms of understanding genomics complexity and require precise expertise for iterative testing and harnessing uh, delivery techniques that work with the biological, with the cellular substrate. As we speak, AI technologies provide more direct and optimal ways, uh, so to speak, to impose precise surveillance, repression, and targeting uh, on civilian populations across different societal models. There is also with AI an important phenomenon, which is uh, the problem of an increasing socialization of risks, meaning that uh, collective harms can creep in, impacting civilian populations in our social contracts. And therefore, there is a more direct impact on the integrity of information with consequences for social trust and on human rights and privacy is one, of course. Although you could see this, you could see this changing, I think, and you could see this changing risk calculus uh, as something that we need to look at. As AI and bio converge, you could, you could see instances of genomic surveillance, for example, or you could see the merger of bio and information warfare, and in the future, the use of bioagents for repression on subset of populations. So not the old idea of biowarfare, but new, new, new types of, of misuses and new types of uh, hybrid tactics. I will stop here because I, I talk for a while. Thank you, Eleanor. I think it was a, you know, a very comprehensive way to kind of a, a very comprehensive overview. And I think it's a very kind of a good baseline to, to start the discussion. Um, so perhaps I'd like to turn to, to the, your co-panelists and, and maybe invite them to kind of to react, maybe starting with Rick. Um, 
since I mean you you work for the biosecurity office in, in the Netherlands and uh, so I think I would be interested to kind of um, uh, hear your take on on the, the kind of the commonalities and, and the differences that uh, that uh, we just discussed and especially in relation to the kind of the misuse problem uh, the, the dual use problem so uh, do you agree with uh, uh, you know Eleanor's overview in general and would you add anything uh, in particular on that point? Thank you, uh, Vincent, and thank you all for inviting me to this uh, important uh, webinar. Uh, indeed, I fully agree with all the comments uh, made by uh, Eleanor, and she was really uh, uh, complete with the, everything, I guess. Um, what we see here in the biosecurity space is the, indeed also with uh, uh, biotechnology, AI is coming more into the picture. And um, more and more reports are coming out regarding recommendations uh, or other risks and and it's good that these reports are coming out um, but our main point is how do these reports and recommendations regarding misuse and dual use potential how does this reach to the researcher because it's eventually the researcher that has the responsibility con to conduct uh, legitimate research and not to misuse the research and that's one of the main reasons that the biosecurity office uh, focuses on is to increase the awareness of potential security and uh, dual use issued by the researcher. And there is still a lot of uh, um, ground to gain here because the awareness level of researchers is, is still relatively low. And that's what we uh, seen in the Netherlands, but also uh, in other parts of, uh, of the world. And the awareness level uh, is low. And one thing to increase that is to improve the uh, visibility of our, our office, but also the visibility of, for instance, by safety officers in addressing these issues of what could go wrong and what could be the potential uh, misuses here. So explain to them what is dual use and the researchers should be able to identify potential dual use risk and for that they first need to be aware of that there are indeed a dual use risk here so that's our main task uh, what we do in the Netherlands and also um, with the, the coming up if AI uh, I've seen that there were a lot of uh, programs out there, uh, like language model, but also by design tools, automated science, etc. Um, I think uh, not many researchers in the biotech field are making use of this, as it is still very specialized, and, and the results are not that uh, 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 feasible yet. But still, it will increase, and therefore we should also increase our efforts uh, in the awareness raising activities, not only on the conventional dual use issues regarding, for instance, uh, the transmissibility of influenza virus, but more also the knowledge and technology and methods that are being developed with uh, AI. Thank you, Regan. I think you 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 point to a, a very kind of interesting element, the kind of the level of awareness of the researchers or, or the scientists. And I think it's a point I think we we're going to return to later in the uh, in this in this webinar because I think it's important to kind of also to kind of you know how do we that awareness raising needs to happen in the kind of AI space. I think it's a very interesting point and can happen. Um, now, just maybe to to uh, I would like to kind of invite also Clarissa to to uh, to weigh in on the kind of the also from the perspective of the, the BWC, uh, so the, the Convention on Biological Weapons. Uh, so for more from a kind of a governance perspective, how do you see like any kind of commonalities or differences between the, the two fields? Uh, perhaps especially in connection maybe to some of the point that Elon made around the, the kind of the balancing the, you know, innovation and security and how that plays in the kind of the more kind of a policy discussions. Yeah, in terms of commonalities, of course, both sectors are widely accepted as being a tool for development. So they are going to be the conversations about these two sectors are going to be widely spread, at least within the UN, on different uh, offices and on different treaties. Uh, but also because they are great tools, we also see that they both raise security concerns due to the 
dual use nature. And some organizations that are following that closely will be, of course, the Disarmament Office, the Biological Weapon Convention, but also the World Health Organization, the Disaster Risk Reduction Office. Uh, last week, for example, uh, not we received a statement from the uh, G7 Non-Proliferation Directors Group where they were mentioning different uh, concerns that they also have in AI and bio had their own sections as well. So as we see it within UN, but also outside UN, uh, many key stakeholders are paying attention to both. So that will be one commonality. The second one will be that in both the private sector is playing a crucial uh, role as a hub of innovation and as a powerful stakeholder. So a quick example, we have now yearly um, the AI for Good Summit, which is uh, organized by the International Telecommunications Union, which is a UN specialized agency for digital technology. And outside the UN, we also have many NGOs that work with us uh, in for reinforcing the policy side. And I have heard today, for example, that there has been an AI bio forum that is being organized. And I saw that the, the presence of big tech companies uh, attending this. So the private sector is, is present. The third commonality will be, of course, that they both are emerging disruptive technologies. You know, I remember 2003 when was the first time that we could read the, the human genome. 20 years later, even, even less than that, we can edit cells in our own bodies. It's just fascinating. And it's the same for AI. You can see that uh, image recognition started in 2010, language understanding 2018, and one year later, uh, AI is performing uh, better than humans since 2019 in reading comprehension, image recognition, and so on. So what does this mean for international governments? Well, the obvious, the tech goes faster than policy. When I arrived here and we were talking about an outcome in 2027, I was like, 2027, like, why is it slow? But, you know, some months later, I'm like, 2027, great. Like, it's so close because that's how policy process are, uh, are, being, are happening at the moment. And in terms of, of difference, let me just say uh, four quickly. One will be that in terms of security, we do have an existent, uh, the existence of a multilateral legal framework, a binding treaty for prohibiting the creation of bioweapons, right? We cannot use biology to create uh, a weapon of mass destruction. This is something that we don't have for the AI, AI sector yet. In terms of investment, I think the AI sector is receiving much more uh, investment on the, on the latest year. And that also is linked to market control, at least as I personally see it, because it appears that a concentration of power exists uh, for a small group within the AI system, whereas for bio, the, it's more widespread and in more different countries. And of course, all these aspects uh, influence not only disarmament, which is our topic, but also trading, economic negotiations, negotiations, uh, military expense, expenditure, and the ge geopolitical aspects of negotiations. Thank you, Clarissa. And I think uh, no, I think you, you uh, underline a lot of, uh, you know, it's indeed. We see a lot of similarities and, and uh, between the, the two at the policy level between the, the two two space. Maybe I'd like to kind of just um, to kind of finish kind of to set the stage a bit on on. The, uh, I'd like to return to to Eleanor for a second, and especially on the kind of the convergence issue. And I mean, as I just mentioned, this kind of AI and bio uh, uh, track uh, discussion track. Um, so I mean, I'm sure that many people in the audience have noticed that uh, there's been a lot of discussion, especially in the policy space over the past year around. The risk stemming from uh, from advances in generative AI and the fact that you know some of these advances could be misused to potentially make the the design and production of biological weapons uh, easier, uh, cheaper, and possibly uh, more dangerous. So I, I, you know um, I would like to just invite you to just to maybe react on that very briefly, if if you can, and you know, what's your take on this type of a. Uh, on this kind of narrative around uh, how AI is fueling bioweapon risk. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, as we all uh, highlighted, I think that that's really um, this is really where the convergence of AI and biotech forces us to not only see risks on a longer evolving time frame with potential for sudden acceleration, like uh, Clarissa mentioned, but also forces us to constantly redefine our notions of dual use and uh, dual use scenarios. 
So now to give you my take um, on this specific question, I think that what we need to consider is how AI specifically can reduce the need for tacit knowledge and capacity to run uh, sophisticated lab equipment. And in that scenario, you have to distinguish between different AI tools. So first you have indeed generative AI models, large language models, LLMs. They could help malicious actors with limited expertise access existing dual use knowledge, so existing information prone to misuse. And already today, a generative AI models can provide access to publicly available information on how to obtain or design bio agents. For example, um, you know, uh, published reverse genetic protocols. They can, they can also help locate uh, relevant equipment, facilities, and opportunities for outsourcing. However, today for malicious actors that would not that do not have training either in biodesign or in mammalian cell culture, uh, for instance, significant barriers would remain in terms of tacit knowledge to successfully design and test, the testing is a big issue too, toxins or pathogens and their interaction with the cellular substrate. But in the medium term, you could see how uh, LLMs could help, you know, better conceptualize and plan different type of, uh, of, of targeted attacks. Um, in the near future, what we could also see is that LLMs could uh, build on the convergence with other emerging techs, such as nanotech and inhalation vaccines to figure out new pathways to delivery. So it kind of gives you new ideas, right? Uh, it is also likely that LLMs will merge different types of scientific mentorship, and I think that's important. So text, but also audio and video, uh, which could increasingly support lab work for less sophisticated malicious actors. And another interesting problem with the fact that malicious actors could increasingly access and process dual use information is that it could help them devise disinformation strategies that could be used as a threat multiplicator in hybrid warfare scenarios. It make, makes them a little bit more knowledgeable, basically. But then the other tools that are maybe more interesting to look at or maybe more uh, strategic is um, what we call AI-led biodesign tools. So really what you have in a laboratory, right? We, which could help uh, malicious actors with enough expertise in this case bypass sequence-based biosecurity measures, basically the measures we use today. Uh, decentralized technologies for DNA synthesis and DNA assembly could allow an actor with enough expertise to assemble a benign DNA fragments into gene sequences that can be subsequently modified and synthesized, becoming the basis to produce a toxin or a bioagent, and this without having to acquire from a company or a lab uh, genetic sequences of concern or undergo uh, investigations. Same, you know, the same way you could see tools um, like those algorithms used to predict toxicity or pathogenicity that could be misused, or the same beneficial AI models used to predict bioactivity in drug discovery that could be repurposed by malicious actors. But in contrast to generative AI, uh, biodesign tools improved by, uh, by, by algorithm and by automation uh, may be able to produce toxin, peptide, or pathogen designs that are not found in nature. So what we get at is this, this customizing, uh, you know, this way of, of having a custom design that could target specific vulnerabilities in populations, for instance, uh, evading immunity mechanisms. Um, something we need to think about also is how using AI um, you know, uh, right now we still need some expertise to, to use those biodesign tools, but in the, uh, in the future, if they are merging with AI lab assistance programs, uh, if they are becoming, uh, you know, easier to use, and if there is more precision and, and iteration, this could progressively change the game. Uh, so here again, sophisticated, sophisticated actors could change, uh, could work through these challenges in state level programs, what we call usually breakout programs, and use the convergence with new delivery techniques. So that's, that means, you know, potentially more precise targeted biological and chemical weapons, or that means if you have automation, precision, and reverse genetic protocols, facilitating the production of already known form of bioagents of concerns, you know, them, pox, influenza viruses, other zoonotic threats. Thank you, Eleonore, for, I mean, uh, that's, I think that's a good segue into uh, the second segment of our discussion to where we're going to talk a bit about risk mitigation. I think you underlined very well the, the fact that, you know, there's, uh, so, you know, both fields have a lot of, you know, dual use challenges. And I think that as they converge increasingly, that that creates a, its own set of of risks. So perhaps uh, I'll, now I'm going to hand over to to Charles, who's just going to walk us uh, through the discussion about what uh, the biosector is already doing in terms of, like, 
mitigating the, the risk of misuse. Over to you, Charlie. Thanks very much, Monsanto. Thank you very much to the panelists for everything so far. It's been incredibly interesting. And I think that does take us very neatly into this point about risk mitigation. And in fact, a question on this has already come up in the Q&A. And I'll remind the audience, because we mentioned just at the very beginning, you're welcome to put in questions all throughout the session. We'll have a few minutes at the end to draw some of them out and give them to the panelists. And it's a good point raised in the Q&A. And I think one point we should underline here is when we talk about the things that we could possibly learn from the biosector is not that we're trying to take it as a blueprint, that it's not there is a one-to-one -one model that can go over, but based on some of the similarities we've just been discussing, and in fact, based on some of the differences, what are some of the key things we need to be aware of, how we can take a closer look at how bio-risk is governed and especially how it's mitigated and what lessons that can provide for AI risk governance. So I want to start by turning to you, Clarissa. You work in the field of science and diplomacy, and as part of your work consists of ensuring the implementation of the Biological Weapons Convention, which you discussed uh, quickly in the last section. If we take a focus on the BWC, how does this instrument address the risk of misuse of civilian research and innovation? And what other instruments or mechanisms complement that convention in the pursuit of this objective? And especially with sort of in the back of our minds, given that we may be looking at some kind of an instrument in this space on the AI side, what kind of things could we draw from that and what lessons could we learn? So over to you, Clarissa. Yes, I think I'm going to start with your first two questions. Uh, well, the Biological Weapon Convention has 15 articles. I think I can uh, use three of them to, to answer that. The first one will be that article number one is quite clear in delineating that in any circumstances, a state party can develop, produce, stockpile, acquire, uh, or retain agents that have no justification for prophylactic, uh, protective, or other peaceful purposes. So, and it's the same way for equipment that is related to the delivery of such agents. Uh, the second article, which is Article 4, is mainly focused on legislation, what at the national level state parties can do. So uh, this article says that uh, state, parties, state parties need to take necessary measures in accordance with their constitutional processes to prohibit uh, bioweapons, and that could include regulations, uh, change of the law, and other administrative initiatives. In that context, uh, the Biological Weapon Convention is now offering assist, uh, assistance to state parties in Africa, and we have a, a group of uh, a legal team that is helping them uh, assessing their regulatory authority, licensing system, and other enforcement mechanisms to really prohibit uh, this creation of bioweapons. Um, we also have uh, the uh, national contact points, which are um, experts assigned by the, um, the, the state parties to be the ones that are the focal points to help us implement the convention. So they are not only following uh, the legal assistance, but they are also submitting CBMs, which is a report that is created with the aim to uh, build trust between state parties. And then finally, we have Article 10, which is very focused on cooperation and assistance. And this assistance could be from exchange of equipment in that is helping the progress of science and technology knowledge for peaceful purposes. But we also have some offers from, from countries that are focused on capacity building. And some component of that capacity building sometimes include um, ethical issues. And that's the case for, uh, for example, the course that is um, using the Tianjin biosecurity guidelines for codes of conduct for scientists. Now, I would also like to uh, draw uh, some gaps that I have been able to, 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 to see while I have been here. And I think that um, the private sector presence is not um, totally effective uh, in our conventions. For example, when we have um, uh, our annual meetings, we usually invite academics uh, experts to come and talk about uh, important points in developments of science and tech, but we rarely have someone from the private sector coming and giving this. Uh, today also, we had um, 
uh, capacity building for national contact points, which are the, the key person uh, supporting the convention at the national level, that told us that when they are trying to fill up these CBMs, which are the confidence building measures, this report to build trust among state parties, sometimes they have problems when they want um, the private sector to disclose which type of research they are doing. So that's um, some of the aspects that I can pick up from, from uh, the private. Uh, the second thing will be that um, because we have seen that technology is going fast, of course, we, we see the need that um, the diplomats need to deepen a little bit um, grasp. They need to grasp this dynamic field and understand sometimes technicalities of AI and bio. So that's why uh, the working group is, is a group that is supporting the chair of the biological convention, is currently discussing um, a set of recommendations for the creation of a science and technology review mechanism, and an, also an international and cooperation assistance mechanism to support the, the work of the convention. So this, these two key instruments will be uh, really great in order to, to secure that we are, we are <laughs> using bio for, for peaceful purposes. And I think your second question was, what are the instruments that complement our work? Uh, well, first of all, uh, there is a UN Security Council uh, resolution, which is called 1540 from 20 years ago that prohibits the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. So that's one, one decision that comes from up there. <laughs> and then we also have, of course, the Chemical Weapon Convention, which is uh, a convention that is very well developed. And there is some overlap when we talk about research of toxins. And we also have the World Health Organization doing an excellent job. And recently we were uh, seeing one of the um, great examples of that, which is the, the creation of the global guidance framework for the responsible use of life sciences. Uh, that's one. And then the other one is the, the one that is being negotiated now, which is the future of pandemic treaty. So, um, of course, these, these offices support us and help us, but I would also like to say that NGOs and academia do an excellent job to support our uh, policy um, process by giving us scientific evidence as well. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Clarissa, and that was very comprehensive. I'm really glad in particular to get some books on Article 10, and you uh, underlined CBMs that maybe we can return to later, but I also want to underline for those in our audience who aren't necessarily from a disarmament or uh, peace and security background, how useful those confidence building measures are. And particularly the point that you raise around the private sector, which you also brought up earlier, I think as well as this idea of the private sector, not just as incredibly relevant in terms of an innovation hub, but also as a key actor that is maybe under engaged with. And taking that perspective, I wanna to turn to Rick for a minute and give the floor to you, because I think it'd be useful to also look from the kind of research practice perspective. So wondering if we take that look from the researcher's position, try and identify whether there's any friction in the implementation of some of these risk mitigation measures that we've referred to so far, or some of the things that uh, have been called for by some of these elements. Part of the reason I want to underline that is in response to some of the things that have come up in the Q&A already, when people are also talking about some of the trade-offs between open and closed research and so on. So with that, uh, Rick, maybe you could provide us with some examples of measures or some other issues that are considered good practice in the biosecurity space, especially from that uh, researcher perspective. Thank you, Charles. Also, uh, thank you, uh, Clarissa, for this elaboration on the Biological Web Convention. And um, regarding the research sector itself, the, the, the researchers and, and students, the PI, et cetera, I must say that the, the awareness level regarding biological weapons convention is, is relatively low. So that's also a task for us to uh, uh, improve that uh, level. Um, regarding biosecurity risk mitigation measures, there are a lot of documents out there. And Pleasure also mentioned the uh, global guidance framework um, for the responsible use of life sciences, which has been uh, published uh, last year by the World Health Organization. Uh, it's a very nice uh, framework um, that can help uh, not only researchers, but also publishers, uh, funders, uh, universities, institutes, but also um, uh, national governments on how to implement um, uh, responsible life sciences regarding uh, dual use issues uh, that could arise there. 
So it's it's a framework, and um, well, we discuss it also with uh, researchers uh, in, in different fields. And what we uh, experience is that there is still lacking, um, well, uh, a knowledge on how should we implement such a framework. Um, it's still too broad, so um, therefore uh, we conduct a lot of uh, outreach activities with the DY Security Office. And one of the examples uh, that we take is, for instance, to produce different tools. So regarding by security, we have the self-scan tool. It's a questionnaire um, related to the eight pillars on by security. And within these eight pillars, we have a different set of questions. And with this uh, set of questions, institutes and researchers can see what are the strengths in the laboratory, but also where are the gaps regarding by security. And it's a very helpful tool because they're quite straightforward questions uh, that can be answered. And another tool that we also have been developed and that is widely being used is the vulnerability scan. And it's also based on the eight pillars on biosecurity, but it has more broad questions. So you have a question and you can have different answers. With each answer, you see what are your weakness? and what are your risks, but also there are what are the risk mitigation strategies you can apply. So that's a really uh, a nice tool that, that can be uh, used for researchers all over the world, of course. And regarding the dual use, um, well, what I already said, the awareness level is still very low. So we want to increase that. And we also have been talking with different researchers and by safety officers, and you see that the definition of the concept of dual use, dual use research, dual use research of concern, export controls, etc., and uh, it's not on the same level. So, um, for instance, one of the institutes said, "Well, we do have an export license, so we don't have dual use issues anymore." So that was really a task for as well. We should have it on the same playing field, and so we created an animation uh, video in which we explain these differences. And with that, the researcher becomes more uh, aware of it. And the other tool that we developed is the dual use quick scan. And that's an, uh, an, an hand on tool uh, freely available on the website with 15 questions uh, regarding the, the pathogens, but also a question regarding knowledge and technology. So you can incorporate AI here as well. And also three questions about the possible uh, uh, results when it has been misused. So what are the consequences for society, for the environment, and for the social political uh, uh, aspect as well? So that's a tool that research should um, uh, frequently fill in just to get a knowledge about uh, are there potential dual use issues with the research being conducted. And this is the first step uh, about identifying uh, dual use issues in research. And the next steps would be, of course, uh, when you identify a uh, dual use issue, then you have to discuss this with your biosafety officer, uh, for instance, to the institutes, and uh, right now uh, with WHO uh, Technical Advisory Group, uh, we're also developing now a system how can uh, um, and parties, state parties, or else other international organizations are, for instance, advised by WHO on these uh, dual use issues. And with that, um, also artificial intelligence it can be uh, very easily incorporated uh, within those uh, frame of questions. So it's it, uh, AI is here just an, uh, another uh, a tool that can be used for biologists to increase their uh, research and to do good, um, but the point is that most of the research are quite naive. They think, well, I'm doing good, I'm uh, trying to create a vaccine, um, but the knowledge and technology they create uh, can be misused by others, and that's something that they are not aware about, or they think, well, that's, that is not real, that cannot be possible, so why are you bothering me with this? So that's one thing uh, that, that we should do, of course, to increase the awareness. And these tools can be helpful with them and also with AI incorporated in. Thank you very, very much, Rick. And as that's a very helpful way for us to also promote this program, because one of the key points of the program is 
it can be very difficult as a scientific practitioner, whether it's on the biospace or from our side, particularly AI practitioners, to know what the possible risks might be. But then even if you do know what the risks are, who is responsible, as you say, you know, after you have identified a risk, who do you talk to, what happens next, what might be the possible second and third order impacts. I think it's really helpful also to have your review of some of the tools and how wide ranging those tools can be, whether they're, you know, you mentioned the quick scans, questionnaires, but also things like outreach and communications, like the animation, like ways to convey the information. And I think that's a really important point. And actually, Eleanor, if it's okay, I'll turn to you on this, which is particularly around this idea of awareness. So it has also been our experience, and I think this is a relatively commonly recognized, is that awareness of governance issues and requirements can be quite low. And then even within that, awareness of the peace and security governance requirements can also be even lower. But at the same time, and Clarissa, I think you pointed towards this earlier as well, the technical awareness in the other direction, especially within policy circles and governance circles, can also be quite low. So the knowledge of how to implement some of the provided frameworks or operationalize them, even when they exist, can be a little bit weak. So Eleanor, turning to you, you have been engaging a lot with the community of scientists that work on genomics. So we'd be really interested in having your take on how these high level objectives and measures for biosecurity translate into lab practice, especially in that context. So when we talk about these risk mitigation measures and awareness, to what extent would you say that they are broadly understood and that they are broadly applied as they are intended to be? Yeah, thank you so much, Charlie. Um, I, mean, you, I think you said something important. I'm, I'm going to answer the question, of course, but uh, you know, when you talked about awareness, and that was raised by the other panelists too, but I think there is a need for scientific communities in biotech and, and probably AI too, to, get, to actually get more exposure, more education on peace and security topics, and uh, to have a more refined notion of what we could mean by dual use. I think something that's important too is an assessment of how well we are doing on biosecurity and AI security among researchers. So this kind of reflexive thinking about how well we are doing. But I would say when, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of work you know, specifically at the convergence of AI and biotech. And so I would say that up to recently, um, those communities, those that are working at the front line of functional genomics and precision medicine, and those that are working on biosecurity, uh, were evolving in different silos, not necessarily sharing insights on what constitute dual use knowledge in AI and biotech. Uh, but as it happens with certain accelerating dynamics of tech convergence and particularly the burst in generative AI and automation, now everybody is kind of forced to a wake up call. Uh, and given the erosion of non-proliferation architectures and new challenges of democratization, I think we are facing a strategic moment where those two communities are starting to ask uh, two questions. And the first one is, what are what are we trying to prevent or control? Um, that's the first one. The second one is more about actors and behaviors. So what responsible behavior are we trying to, to promote? Uh, and here, the biotech and biosecurity communities have shown interesting directions to follow, I think, that could inspire governance for responsible AI and for the convergence of AI and biotech. And I think uh, first, we need to move uh, towards functional definitions of activities that could become source of concern. And uh, this is um, intersecting a little bit with some of the questions that have been asked uh, in the chat. Um, so it's more about methodology and what we're trying to prevent. How do we uh, get to those functional definitions of um, dual use concerns, right? And while Dirk policies have been useful and important, one critique uh, that was uh, opposed to them is their rigidity, right? So trying to solidify concerns as we speak while we need an evolving uh, notion of dual use. As the scope of AI and biotech uh, research widens, our definition of dual use will change. And so this should be an iterative, inclusive, and foresight-based process. And this type of work has been quite well developed by students and universities uh, in the context of international competitions. And a good example is IJM, where really that uh, type of foresight has been you know, um, experimented with uh, by, uh, by students themselves working on their projects. A second, um, you know, as we need to move towards better monitoring transfer of dual use knowledge and tech know-how and overseeing mentorship and functional data, uh, we need to, to better understand 
you know, what I talk about when I say intentionality in bio design and AI design. And I think that's where the two fields are really intersecting. It's that, that method of thinking about using foresight for thinking about intentionality, what is being done, you know, with this specific techniques in AI or what with this specific technique in, in genomics, what are we trying uh, to, what are we intending to produce? So that relies on better understanding the functions provided by a combinations of DNA sequences and what they code for uh, when, you, when you look at the biotech sector, of course. I think what is also crucially missing uh, in public and private innovation sectors are something I mentioned before, but forms of cross-tech foresight where security experts learn enough about each converging field and its impact on dual-use research. So I think we need more of those kind of collaborations across AI, biotech, and cybersecurity, a little bit like it's being done uh, within IGN. And finally, uh, another interesting lesson, and I think that has been touched upon in the questions in the chat too, um, another lesson coming from the biosecurity communities is to build incentives and capacity for the private sector and academia to participate in that foresight, as well as policy and non-proliferation screening, or to some extent give them you know, strong incentives and uh, mandate uh, to, to, to participate and implement that kind of foresight themselves. And a good example uh, from the biosecurity field is the common screening platform to prevent illicit gene synthesis led by uh, the International Gene Synthesis Consortium. And the advantages of such a platform include allowing a common way uh, to access and update screening algorithms um, for, for, for biosecurity screening, but also a second advantage is economies of scale. It makes it affordable for existing DNA synthesis company to co-develop and maintain uh, this updated screening system. And finally, there is no barriers to entry for new DNA synthesis company. Uh, they can take advantage of this uh, universal screening capacity that exists as a platform. So in a way, can we think of you know, building those kind of platforms where we have an evolving notion of dual use and where uh, we provide capacity and incentive uh, for, for screening and for anticipation um, and where there is a cross sector and eventually a cross technology uh, involvement. Thank you very, very much, Eleanor. And I think uh, just to pick up on just one of the many points that you raised, I think intentionality is a really interesting and important way for us to consider how to move forward. And that really puts us in a good position to pivot to the final section, which is looking at the lessons for the AI community and responsible innovation in AI. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Vincent, who will uh, guide us through this set of questions and discussion. Thank you, Charlie, and, and thank you to the panelists. And I think um, it's a fantastic segue. So I think in, we, over the you know, past 10 minutes, we, we uh, all the panelists mentioned several times the, the kind of uh, the lack of awareness around the kind of the, the dual use risk, but also potentially the, the need for, for enabling practitioners to you know, better engage in, in responsible innovation. So I thought that maybe we could take a bit of time to kind of zoom in on that that problem, the kind of the more educational element and how to what extent we can, you know, capacity building and education can be used as a vector for promoting and enabling a responsible innovation practice with a view to kind of mitigate uh, dual use risk and misuse risk. Uh, so I'd like maybe to, to kind of return to uh, to Rick in that context, since uh, you, you know, you are um, much, much of your work at the, you know, biosecurity office involved, you know, educating and raising awareness. So perhaps, um, and uh, you mentioned some of the tools that you have been using, and uh, yeah, I, I, you know, we we done a bit of research, and we showed that you have been published some instructive videos, fact sheets. Uh, you have organized workshops and so on, um, done scenario exercise and everything. So perhaps you could share with your experience about you know kind of a capacity building and and what especially if we have to kind of look at what can we transfer to the you know in the AI space, what would be the kind of good way to introduce the uh, future kind of AI practitioners to uh, to the kind of the dual use risk problem, um, what are the things that they would need to learn? Um, but also what would be some, maybe some of the challenges to bear in mind in terms of like how to promote this type of, of education? Thank you, uh, Vincent. Indeed, uh, these are real uh, challenges, uh, how to reach uh, that uh, community and how to build the capacity uh, within it. So. Uh, I was talking about the researchers. Uh, we do a lot of them uh, regarding outreach activities and those tools. Um, but you need to remember, of course, that the researchers are all students. And the students 
these are the, the new researches for the future. And if you make them already aware with the concept of dual use, of misuse, the potential by technology and AI, then you are really a way ahead already. Uh, as they are the future uh, uh, researchers in, in the laboratory. So with that, we're also focusing now on, uh, on, on students of high school, not only high school, but the universities, um, in which we try to uh, get some uh, space in their curriculums to uh, educate them regarding by safety, by security and dual use issues. And, what we normally do is that before they enter the, uh, their first research project in the laboratory, they had to read uh, the write a uh, project proposal and we screen those proposals. And with most of the proposals, you can pick up quite easily dual use aspects. And if you uh, highlight those dual use aspects to the students, then there is a really a wake up call for the students because that's they never had the idea that there was a dual use potential within their own research proposal. So that's a, an a enormous uh, um, a gain of, of awareness so that we raised there. Um, but the hard thing is um, that all the curricula, as far as I know in the Netherlands, but also abroad, are really full with everything. So there is no, no space to have just one hour in a year to have an additional lecture regarding by security or dual use. So that's that's really a challenge. So we try to approach then the, the board of directors of uh, the university, but also by safety officers to get some space in those uh, lectures uh, and curricula. And um, but you must also do that from the top down uh, level. So the Ministry of Education, for instance, up to the board of the universities, you have to promote it. And so that is really important. And for AI, that's also a thing to start with students. But I think with AI, you need to start much earlier already with high school students um, because they're using AI already on their mobile phones. Uh, think about TikTok, etc. That's also AI uh, with all the things that they do. And they need to be aware of uh, potential uh, dual use issues with it, but also privacy issues, of course. So that's for us our main challenge, um, I think, to, to make those uh, students of high school, but also university students, aware of the risk. Uh, and the later on, then they can, when they are still working in laboratories, they still have the notion of what they learned during the university's uh, um, studies. Well, I can do research, but I know there could be potential misuse and that there could be potential dual use issues. And then uh, you already have accomplished your mission regarding awareness raising. And the next thing is then, then that it's easier to identify potential um, dual use issues with it. Thank you, Rick. And I think, I mean, it's uh, it's very encouraging to hear since, I mean, part of the purpose of the uh, UNODAC pre-initiative uh, that we have is about promoting kind of this type of, of education. So it's very kind of interesting to hear the, your your experience from the biosecurity space. So I think maybe I'd like to turn to Clarissa now and, and just to kind of focus back on the role of, of international institutions in that context. And um, especially with regard to kind of like helping or enabling that capacity building and education um, and some of the people in the audience know that there's a pretty active debate now on the governance of AI and uh, the UN Secretary General decided to create a high level advisory body uh, for the governance of AI um, last, uh, last summer and uh, the, the uh, expert body will present a report in September I believe. Uh, and they are notably discussing the idea of having a kind of an international or several in international institutions uh, to, to govern AI. So, you know, maybe that's the question here is whether you see potentially like a room for also, you know, baking in some aspect related to education and capacity building. And, and, and if so, um, is there any practical lessons that, uh, the, you know, the whatever future kind of AI institution could learn from the BWC in terms of like supporting states or... Uh, or directly engaging with the practitioners? Yes, um, I think there are some aspects from that are common among our conventions on disarmament or the organizations linked to our conventions. So the first one will be the aspect of universalization. 
like how many countries can become state parties of your international agreement binding a, a tool. And that will be a way to secure higher chances of success and also complementarity to achieve multilateralism. And the second thing will be everything related with uh, cooperation and, and assistance, of course, because it's, it's crucial to, to assist countries in order to level up the knowledge as well. When you come to the convention and you need to negotiate things, you need to have, hopefully, you, you want to aim that everyone is at the same knowledge and understands what are like the pros, the cons, um, the uncertainties as, as, as well. And that will be, I think, key. So th that will be the second one. The third one will be related with science diplomacy, which is bringing scientific evidence to, of course, uh, support the policy process. But I also think that it's not just bringing the academics and the scientists to a panel and have you know, a presentation. I think it's important to have a bi-directional communication that aims to build trust. And that be building trust will, will be um, crucial for having a, a long-standing uh, relation between these two groups, because in that case, both can understand what does it mean timelines? For academics, timelines means something completely different than policymakers. And the same with the demands. And also I think the understanding that even if we have facts, facts are gonna be shaped by policy. And this, this is something that, for example, academics need to understand as well. And when they both are together and understand this together, maybe more uh, efficient solutions can be created. And the, the fourth aspect will be related to technical assistance, which is what I see is that it's mostly focused on preparedness, detection and response to bio threats. And I feel that as in the health system, you know, you want also something related to prevention, right? So if we can put more time, more budget, more negotiations, more policy conversations about the prevention, I think that will also be uh, uh, really great. And then the last one that is common for, for, for most of our conventions will be adaptability. And this is linked to having an inclusive language that is gonna withstand the passing of time. So if we go and see at the conventions, some, you know, the BWC is going to be 50 years next year. The question will be how much of the text that is written is still relevant and, and how easy it is to change it or not. So I think that adaptability, even in, in thinking which type of words or which type of topics we are going to ask the, the Science Advisory Board, for example, to focus on, will be uh, important to, to think, have these future lenses, I think, for that. And some things that are uh, common to only some conventions will be also the lenses of foresight, which you already mentioned. I think it's important to be ready and keen to anticipate the future. Uh, and this is with a simple example. I remember the first time I saw a mobile phone on the street. In that moment, I was not thinking like, oh, in the future, maybe I can send an email or have, I don't know, my Tinder date, you know, like whatever because it was just not, it was something that you will not even connect at that time. And 20 years later, we can do even more than that. So I think this foresight uh, process is, is really important. The second one will be everything related with infrastructure for monitoring and verification. And for example, with CTVTO, which is an organization aiming to, to create a world free of nuclear testing, they have an international data center, they have an international monitoring systems, which are like physical infrastructures with, uh, with uh, technical expertise that is doing this type of thing. So I wonder like, how will it be for AI? Do we need to think about these structures and these equipments and this technical expertise as well? And these hubs maybe in different countries to monitor different geographical sections. And the last one will be, of course, to keep up with scientific uh, development and not only on the life sciences, but also on the evolution of everything related with social and humanities, because they go hand to hand. Sometimes it's not enough that we have the facts. It's important if those um, policy solutions that we are thinking based on the facts are going to be efficient or not. And this, that's when social and humanities should have these conversations with the life scientists and with the policymakers together to come up with better ideas. 
Thank you, Clarissa. I mean, you, you made some fantastic point. I mean, I, I will not try to kind of summarize them properly. I think you underlined, you know, you know, one aspect is the reach to ensure that, you know, actually the, the institution will be able to kind of reach out uh, we, you know, to the entire community. And, and also you underline also the importance of making it kind of like future proof and being able to kind of adapt to uh, and foresee uh, uh, emerging uh, technological change and so on. So these are very important points. So now maybe I'd like to turn to, to Eleanor and maybe to... Um, you know, since we just talk about foresight and, and so on, I need to connect back to the issue of convergence, uh, especially in terms of like, you know, if we were to kind of um, think of like what would be a good practice to actually address this the kind of the misuse risk or the dual use risk associated with the convergence between AI and bio. Um, and, and especially if we want to try to kind of target, especially like the, the, the practitioners, uh, the organizations that are working at this nexus between, uh, you know, developing AI for medicine or pharmacology and so on. So what should they be kind of like doing for, for actually mitigating some of the, the misuse risks that, uh, that you uh, discussed a bit earlier? Yeah, thank you, Vincent. Uh, that's actually, a, it's an interesting but a tough question for companies I, I talk to. Uh, often, but I would start with so there, there is a need to improve um, oversight approaches based on you know what I mentioned earlier transfer of dual use knowledge. So it's not just physical equipment; it's really this notion of expertise and knowledge at the intersection of AI and biotechnologies. And so, for example, it would be useful to use foresight to look at how generative AI models and AI bio design tools will increasingly converge and how they are impacting uh, the trade landscape. And we could start that kind of work, and especially those companies uh, working at the intersection could start that kind of work now. Uh, there is also a need to reconsider uh, evolving notions of dual use with a focus on functional genomics and intentionality in bio design, as I said earlier. And I think that's you know really uh, uh, the type of work that those companies could could take on. I mean, they are the core of understanding how uh, AI enhance our knowledge of functional genomics, how it make us uh, you know it put us in a position to design. Uh, to custom to customize design in proteins and and and, and other um, you know other molecule uh, substrate and so I think that's really where that question of intentionality um, could could be taken on um, and of course also looking at how AI enhance and intersect uh, with those specific domains. Um, I think the, still the issue of uh, developing capacity building for private sector and academia to participate in those new forms of oversight approach, I think that's important because you have, um, you know, kind of, a, how would I say that, a, a, a form of a capillarity between, you know, the private sector and academia to some extent um, at, at that convergence. And then one thing we really need to think about too is new tools to manage the tension between transparency and security. And that's really not easy, uh, but we can try to do so by maybe using due diligence mechanisms. So first we could be thinking of using uh, pre and post release evaluation of AI models that intersect somehow with biotech. Second, we could also try to control what type of dual use training data are integrated into AI models. So take, for instance, uh, reverse genetic protocols related to pandemic pathogens or other very sensitive gain of function research. Um, what kind of uh, you know, dual use data, training data sets are, are being incorporated into AI led and automated tools? Uh, and third, by using phase gate processes such as maybe pre-publication risk assessment, uh, licensing agreements, different types of differential access, and to some extent also new um, adequate cryptographic or cybersecurity protection when dual use knowledge is involved. So that's, for example, something the Secure DNA project at MIT is looking at uh, when we would be you know, thinking about uh, what functional genomics data uh, you know, could make a, a team of researchers able to enhance a pathogen. How do we, how do we think about uh, cryptographic techniques, uh, other form of uh, um, of secure, you know, multi-party secure computation techniques that we could use when we need to share knowledge? And to some extent, I think that a question like that came into the, you know, into the, the chat. This notion of open source versus um, versus more closed up. Uh, systems. I mean, phase gate processes like that could help us understand how to organize, um, you know, the, the red teaming and the reviewing and the, ref the refining process 
of different technological tools and with what public and how. To some extent, it's giving back a little bit more power. Though I don't know if that's the right word or control. You know, those words are difficult to use in this context, but uh, it gives us a little bit more leverage on, on how we do this sharing of, of knowledge and how we organize it for good, for responsible innovation, not just for uh, decentralization and proliferation. Thank you. I mean, you, you provided a very, very com comprehensive overview, a lot of very good uh, suggestions here. So I'll not try to recap. So I think um, we are mindful of the time. So I think uh, I think we we want also like um, provide the opportunity for uh, for um, for maybe taking a few questions from the Q and A. So um, I'll stop here for my side. I'll end over to to Charlie. And and with that, I would like to thank the participants, the, the speakers, for their very kind of uh, insightful. Uh, comments and answers. So uh, thank you for me. Thank you very much, Malta. And echoing that, I think we've actually addressed quite a few of the issues that have come up in the Q&A already. But there is one thread that I do want to offer to the speakers to react to, which is specifically around the trade-off between open and closed research. So that comes up in a few different dimensions. So people have also talked about the possibility and I think the feasibility as well of legally mandated research oversight and what the possible implications of that might be. But also the more general question of whether research oversight or uh, restrictions on the openness of research has the potential to harm innovation more than it has a beneficial aspect. So like Wilson says, we're quite short. Uh, we're coming towards the end of our time. We have about three minutes left. But I do want to give each of the panelists a chance if they have a sentence or two to react to just where they stand on that kind of trade-off and some of the key issues. Uh, so maybe Clarissa, if we turn to you first, and then Eleanor, and then Rick, and then I'll wind up. And also just flag to the audience that on the screen should be the details of the program and the email and contact for myself and for Vincent. So if you have any questions about this session or anything else that is going on under the program, please do reach out to us. Uh, so Clarissa, over to you first. Yeah, I will focus on just one example and I will invite the audience to sing with me, right? So at the convention for biological, the, yeah, for the biological weapon convention, we have the CBMs, which is uh, the tool for building trust, the one that I say um, state parties write a report about their ongoing research, vaccine development, and so on. That's on one side. And then the other thing will be verification, to go to the place to verify that bioweapons are not being uh, built. So between these two, there must be something in between or there is nothing in between. Because if we just focus on the CBMs, which is the, the tool that we have nowadays, and then there is closed research where um, governments or private decide not to disclose some information, I wonder if this trust is gonna be broken or if it's gonna be a half trust, right? So in that case, if you are a person that is um, more keen about closed research, so what will be for us in our case, like what will be the other tool that we can use that accepts that close research, but help us to build trust among state parties that none of them is uh, developing a bioweapon deliberately. So I think that that's a question that um, for us will be very interesting to know, to, to, to learn and to know more and hear ideas, because uh, I also feel that Personally, there must be something in between, perhaps, because if we go for a verification process, it's going to be a very costly as well, right? And I, it's supposed to also build trust. But I wonder if we think about the evolution of diplomacy, the, the evolution of multilateralism, can be, can we be a little bit of a dreamers and also try to innovate within the policy process and think about a new tool that can come to the disarmament uh, conventions and treaties that will be absolutely fascinating, fascinating for us. And sorry. I think it was just an echo. Okay, well, and I just encourage everyone to please think uh, together with us about uh, if the CBMs are the best tool, if there is something that we can change, or if verification is something inherently for all conventions. Thank you. No, I think that's a great call to think to be innovative, but also to question what do we mean when we talk about confidence and trust? And so Eleanor, over to you, and then to Rick, and then I'll close this up. Yeah, so you know what, I will focus my, my answer on what can be translated from bio to AI, so focusing more on the AI sphere and why. Um, I think because of this issue of socialization of risks and especially the impact on human rights, uh, we cannot even you know discuss the need for oversight. It, it, it is a need. I mean, we need it for responsible innovation in AI. 
Um, and so maybe mandated research like Dirk, you know, that could be uh, translated into the AI sphere only if we address the critique that have been made to Dirk in the past, critique coming from the biotech biosecurity community, and especially the fact that you don't want to solidify thinking. You want to be sure that you include in their foresight, foresight, evolving notion of dual use, and do that red teaming, you know, with, with emerging the next generation of, of researchers. Um, and so I think one question was also saying, you know, how do we, it's so decentralized in AI, big labs, how do we get them in? We need to get them in. And it's kind of, you know, there is a form of, um, what would I say, concentration. So we can identify them, right? having them you know forcing them to have human rights labs inside you know their their research work with those labs uh, work with uh, international competitions like we do with IGM then also this notion of the international gene synthesis platform can we build that kind of platform for AI and create emulation and show that responsible innovation has to be done and and you know has to lead the way so basically to conclude you know how can we organize um this involvement of open source public uh, refining of tools, but how we can how can we organize them? So it's just not you know a, a kind of full full on proliferation without uh, without collective thinking. Thank you very much, and it's a very important call for how do we actually think it through and organize it. So Rick, over to you. Yes, regarding openness science, I first would like to highlight the uh, the common gene synthesis uh, consortium regarding the screening protocol, and one of the key issues is there, know your customer. So who is ordering a specific sequence? So that build also builds uh, already trust. And uh, regarding know your customer, um, also the point with open science, I, am, I really appreciate that the science and research should be open, uh, the freedom of research as well. And if you have a publication in which you're out, uh, potential to reduce risk, and these risks are addressed as really serious risks, then you can always leave a part of this, uh, of the research out of the publication and make it only available to people uh, that you know. So that's indeed, again, know your customer. So you cannot um, make this information publicly available, but it will be available uh, only to the uh, interested people and the people that you know and that you trust. So building trust within the community is, is really key in here. Thank you very much, Rick. And we come back to trust then again, and also these concepts like know your customer, which in the autonomy space, you can also see in robotics and other industries. So with that, I want to thank all of our panelists very, very much. In fact, some additional questions actually came through in the Q&A uh, as we were speaking. So I'll just underline that if anyone wants to contact, they have these addresses. And also that my colleagues will be sharing a short survey in the chat for all of the uh, audience members. This is to help us guide this program. It's a three-year program funded by the European Union and working basically these goals that we've all just discussed. So any insights would be very greatly appreciated. So with that, I want to thank all of our panelists very much and thank very much all of the participants. This has been an incredibly informative and insightful discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank very you. much. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.